I can be this high achieving, well spoken, and well educated woman who also is willing to throw around some good old sailor terms if the mood rises. I'm just endlessly amused by the fact that this is what I'm doing for a living now. It just, it really tickles me. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. If I had to pick one word to describe this conversation, it'd definitely have to be the F word. I'm not talking about that F word. I'm talking about the word fun. Sarah Knight is a New York Times bestselling author known for being the anti-guru. Through her sweary series of books and journals that started with the life-changing magic of not giving a F, she helps people to say no, to reserve their energy and attention for the things that deserve it the most, and approach each new endeavor with a not-sorry type attitude. I'm excited to chat with Sarah about her tried and true methods for setting boundaries and pursuing a life you actually want to live. She's also completely hilarious and super down to earth. So I am so excited for a life-changing conversation with plenty of laughs along the way. Here she is, Sarah Knight. Rooms by Rivoli gives you access to professional living room, bedroom, and home office designs without the high cost of hiring a designer. Get furniture options, room colors, schematics, and helpful design tips in a beautifully curated plan at roomsbyrivoli.com, spelled R-I-V-O-L-I, and use the code GOLDDIGGER for 20% off now through May 8th, 2021. Let me help you start your email list in 2021. You could cross that new year goal off of your list in under an hour each day with my free five-day mini course, the 0 to 250 Email List Building Challenge. Get the tutorials, the templates, and the tech with easy-to-follow steps for free at listbuildchallenge.com. All right, Sarah, I am so excited that you are here on the Gold Digger Podcast, so welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to know, you know, I have followed you. I love your books. Paint me a picture of your life before you were a New York Times bestselling author and known as the anti-guru. Sure. Well, before that, I was working as a book editor myself in New York, New York City, the sort of epicenter of American book publishing. And I'd been in that career for 15 years, basically ever since I graduated from college and moved to New York. I followed my boyfriend to New York and he's my husband now. So I can uh, (laughs) can vouch for that being a good life decision. And, you know, I had clawed my way up that ladder and I was you know, started out as an editorial assistant, made my way to senior editor over the course of that 15 years. And I was having a lot of success, you know, not to toot my own horn, but things were going really, really well in the very same year that I decided to blow it all up and quit (laughs) my job and go freelance. And that forms the basis of a lot of the things that I talk about in my books and on my new podcast about how, you know, just because you're operating at a really high level doesn't mean that you're doing everything right or that's best for you. Being happy is a really important component of being successful. And I was experiencing a lot of debilitating anxiety and panic and depression. And I was around, I want to say, 35 years old at that point in 2015. And I had to do a lot of work on myself to figure out that the biggest stressors, the biggest impact on my mental health was my job. And it wasn't because I didn't love it. I I loved collaborating with writers. I loved discovering new voices. It was really exciting to be part of a book's life from inception. But I wasn't really cut out for the corporate environment, I discovered, even though I was good at kind of putting a good face on it and, you know, doing all the things and ticking all the boxes. It wasn't letting me be me. Now, maybe I've gone 180 to the other end of being a a writer and a podcaster with my, my signature potty mouth and everything. But when I say I couldn't be me in my old job, I don't just mean I couldn't speak up and speak my mind the way I wanted to. It just didn't reward my way of thinking, my entrepreneurialness, my contrarian nature. 
was not cut out for big publishing. So I quit that job and I quit that career and I started freelancing. And that was around the time that I had the idea for my first book. So maybe it was all that creative energy unlocked by no longer having to spend so much of it conforming to a particular corporate mold. And yeah, that was about five and a half years ago. And my husband and I not only got through my career change, we actually moved from New York City to the Dominican Republic. So that's where I'm I'm speaking with you from today. Wow. That's incredible. And I want to know, Sarah, because I feel like in my life, I very much relate to your story, but I feel like whenever I've made the decisions to claim back my time and my peace, that's when I get the next idea or or the next curiosity that turns into something. Have you noticed that with yourself too, with making those big life shifts? I sure did. I mean, you know, I think from the time I was a little kid, I always thought I wanted to be a writer. And I'm not sure that young children necessarily know what they're talking about when someone says, (laughs) what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're like, I want to be a a doctor. I want to be a veterinarian. I want to be a fireman. You know, it might just be what's in their kind of brain at any given moment because they just saw firemen walk by. But I always identified with being a writer. And then I just kind of set that aside in my career as a book editor. And I had that sensibility of sort of those who can do and those who can't teach. And I kind of thought to myself, well, it's it's sort of too hard to make it as a writer, but I'm really, really good at helping other writers. So I'll be an editor. And, you know, as it turns out, I was, I did have that kind of fire burning in the background the whole time that I worked in publishing and was able to you know, take a lot of the things that I learned from observing other writers over a decade and a half, not to mention being a lifetime voracious reader. But, you know, I, when I freed up that brain space and I talk a lot about your time, energy, and money as being your core resources and, you know, having to treat those as the finite or semi renewable resources they are, depending on which one we're talking about. And when I was able to free up particularly my time and energy, it turns out that I was able to channel it into writing for myself. And then, you know, and then that took off. And it was definitely something that was unlocked because I made a big, scary, complicated, (laughs) difficult life change. (laughs) But I also like to remind people that you can just make small life changes all the time that improve your day, your week, or your year. You don't have to make the super big ones that I talked about earlier. (laughs) I need to know, what was it like for you shifting from the identity of a decade's worth of work as an editor into the author herself? Like, Even though you had these ideas that you wanted to be a writer as a child, was that a weird transition? Because I feel like a lot of our listeners have worked for other people, but have these desires to go out on their own or do something different. Talk to me a little bit about that identity shift for you. Well, it was huge and not just going from behind the scenes to in front of the curtain sort of in that editor-author relationship, but just the identity of this career that I have forged for myself. You know, I have been since day one an ambitious, type A, overachieving, you know, ultra-organized, successful person. And to turn my back on everything that I had worked so hard for and to also kind of let go of that identity without knowing what my new identity was necessarily going to look like or if it was going to be valued as much by by our society, by my family, by my own self. And this is not to say that, you know, anybody put that pressure on me. I put it on myself. Yeah. And that's another thing that I've been figuring out over the last five years <laughs> or so. That so much of the pressure to conform was really coming from inside the house, so to speak. But that identity shift between being a working woman with a plan and a, you know, and a set of really clear parameters for my career to just go freelance and basically have zero parameters and no structure. (laughs) And also to be on day one of a new career, which means, you know, it was going to be a while before I could quote unquote achieve a level of success and identify as a successful person again. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. I'm so glad you talk about that because I feel like a lot of women, like our identities, especially as women, for men as well, but especially as women, are constantly shifting and evolving. And I feel like we're constantly kind of trying to like clothe ourselves in these new identities. And it's almost like when you go into a fitting room and nothing fits quite right. 
and you want to look really good, but you also want to feel good. And so I think that that's such a crucial part of the conversation, specifically with women in career, because we don't talk about that often enough. And I think that our identity really plays a huge role in how we show up, what we believe to be true for us, what we go after. And so I just, I love that you share that because we are constantly evolving and learning and growing and we're students and we're, we're, you know, ebbing and flowing. And so I just love that so much. And I need to know before we go any further in this interview, tell me about your relationship that you have with the F word, because (laughs) we were chuckling at the beginning before we hit record. And I was like, you know, a lot of moms listen to this show with their children. I listen to podcasts with my daughter. And so walk me through what that looks like, because it definitely makes people pay attention. Well, I have to admit that part of my relationship with the F word uh, is just comes from that whole notion of wanting to just be who I am, uncensored, unfiltered, and not worry about what people think of me and not have to kind of tone myself down in order to communicate. But I'm also, you know, I'm the daughter of two elementary school teachers. I was raised right. I am very polite. I'm very articulate. I have an Ivy League education. And so frankly, it tickles me to be somebody who's famous (laughs) for, you know, for giving salty advice in my books and on my new podcast. So it's partly because I think that that kind of language is frankly very authentic to me and that it resonates with people because it shocks them a little bit out of their comfort zone and they think it's fun and funny and a little bit, you know, naughty and, and it's exciting for them. But also partly because I think it's great that I can be this really high achieving, you know, well-spoken and well-educated woman who also is willing to throw around, you know, some some good old sailor terms uh, <laughs> if the the mood rises. So you know, it's partly it. authenticity that you're hearing from me, and it's partly I'm just endlessly amused by the fact that this is what I'm doing for a living now. It just it really tickles me. <laughs> I love it so much, and I just have to know this is so such a funny question, but. I bet when your parents are like, oh, our daughter, she's an author. She writes these incredible books. And then I can just imagine like Aunt Sally being like, oh, what are the books called? I'm going to go grab them. (laughs) I bet your parents have gotten really good at answering that question. They have. And, you know, honestly, they're they're very, very proud, as are my in-laws. These folks are some of my best cheerleaders, my street team. So I'm grateful for that because I know that not everybody has that. I know that sometimes mm-hmm. the the decisions I've made to blow up my career, the decisions I've made to get <laughs> famous for, for saying the F word, wouldn't sit well always with people's closest family and support system. So I'm really grateful that my parents just think they're as tickled by it as I am. I love it. I love it. So I need to know, what is the very first non-negotiable lesson if we're talking about learning the magic of not giving an F? The number one lesson is you have to stop giving an F about what other people think. Yes. That is Talk the key to, to everything. Talk to me about this. <laughs> so the way I break it down is that you can't control what other people think. All you can control is your behavior. And so if you want to, you know, take the high road, if you want to have integrity, if you want to know that you're being a good person in expressing, for example, your boundaries to other people, then you can do that in an honest and polite way and you've done the best you can. You can't control their reaction. You can hope to mitigate any hurt feelings by being honest and polite with them, but The reality is that some people are not going to like you or agree with you for reasons that are so far beyond your control, you know, because you remind them of someone else they don't like. Because the very first time they met you, they were in a bad mood and they didn't like your laugh. And now they just, you know, they don't think of you as somebody that they like. They could not agree with you because they're jealous that they don't feel capable of making the same decisions and setting the same boundaries that you have for your life. And you can't control that. So my whole ethos is about focusing on what you can control and letting go of what you can't. And giving an F is analogous to caring about something And it also means literally giving the time, energy, and money that I talked about before to that thing. So I say, you really can't care so much about what other people think because you can't control what they think. So you shouldn't be spending your time and energy worrying about it. You should spend your time and energy 
on and care about your behavior and being the best version of yourself or whatever the version of yourself is. Maybe you want to be the worst version of yourself. Go nuts. <laughs> but you can control your behavior. You can't control other people's reaction to it. So that is really the the core idea behind not giving an F about what other people think so that you can really just focus on your own life and making it as pleasurable and productive and efficient and successful and calm, whatever it means to you, make your life the best it can be and not worry so much about what other people think about how you're living it. I think that's so powerful. And I need to know, because you are so eloquent, you are so just incredible with words and and the way that you teach and share and speak. Was that theory and, and your idea, was that lesson put to the test as you grew and as you grew this new identity and this new career? Like were some of these ideas that you talk about today, were they put to the test as you kind of, you know, reformed what people knew you as? Oh, for sure. All five of my (laughs) books and the the whole series of books is basically, you know, an excuse for me to work out my own stuff and and, (laughs) and then teach people how to do it more easily than I figured it out for myself. But specifically with the first book, The Life-Changing Magic of Not Giving an F, you know, that came about as a result of leaving behind that job and that career. And that was a huge identity shift for me. And it was something that was really difficult for me to do. Like I said, even though I wasn't actually getting pressure and judgment from outside forces, I feared that I would be. I made a lot of that up in my own head. So I did have to take my own advice and figure out how to stop spending that time and energy worrying about what other people might think of me and instead redirect it to doing the things I knew I needed to do for my own health, specifically for my mental health. So yeah, I mean, from that book all the way through, especially to to my fourth book, which is called Calm the F Down and is all about anxiety. <laughs> that is a big, that whole book is me figuring out how to deal with my anxiety and then showing other people how to do it. <laughs> mm, I think that's so powerful. And I think that's something that makes you like, I'm just so attracted to you in the sense of it always just feels like you're bringing people along for the journey instead of being like, you know what, I've conquered it all. And here's exactly how to do this on a silver platter, which I think is kind of the point of being the anti-guru. And I think that you have this gift of making people feel like they're not the only one while also shortcutting the time frame that it's going to take for someone to learn all the crazy things that you learned on your own journey. So I just think that is such a gift that you give to other people. Well, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, I really want people to know that none of this is me, you know, being an authority on anything other than what has worked for me. And if what has worked for me helps you, especially because I think a lot of the people who do come to my books already are really interested in self-help and self-improvement, but a lot of people think they don't like self-help or that they don't need it or that it's a little too woo-woo for them. And I was one of those people at one point in my life. So I'm glad that I'm able to talk to people in a in a way that doesn't make them feel condescended to or or talk down to or really, you know, I'm not a drill sergeant. I'm just into whatever works. Whatever yeah. works for you. Yes. I can feel it in my bones. This is the year that you'll start and grow an email list. Let me help. I am so excited to lead you through my free five-day mini course, the Zero to 250 List Building Challenge. An email list is the best way to speak directly to your people via their inboxes. Social media is always in flux. You don't own your followers, and the algorithm is making it more and more challenging to reach the people who need to hear from you. My email list, it's the number one way I reach people and turn subscribers into paying students. If you haven't started your email list or if your list could use some attention in the new year, the Zero to 250 Challenge will lead you through the entire process with tutorials, templates, and tech all taken care of. I'll share my steps for choosing an email service provider, creating a form and a freebie, and collecting valuable email addresses, as well as ideas for what to send to your list once you've started one no matter what type of business you run. Can you commit just 4% of this week to getting yourself results and finally following through? That's just one hour a day, Monday to Friday, for one week in order to get really big results. Are you ready? 
Sign up at listbuildchallenge.com. That's listbuildchallenge.com for the free zero to 250 list building challenge. I'll see you inside. Do you find yourself scrolling Pinterest, saving all the inspiration for your dream living room design and decor, but then you get to the actual process of designing and decorating your own space and you feel a little lost? Rooms by Rivoli by designer Kristen Rivoli is the answer. She curated living rooms, home offices, and primary bedrooms complete with furniture options, layout advice, and design lessons so you can approach your own space with confidence. I've been working on a few home redecorating projects offline and the Copenhagen Living room plan for Rooms by Rivoli is exactly what I was going for, but I couldn't quite nail it down on my own. It's sophisticated, but also comfortable. And I absolutely love that each room includes paint color suggestions because that's always been a big point of indecision when I'm designing my own spaces. Get your professionally designed room on a first home budget at roomsbyrivoli.com and use the code gold digger for 20% off. That's Rooms by Rivoli, spelt R-I-V-O-L-I, and code Gold Digger for 20% off now through May 8th of 2021. Okay, so since we're talking about whatever works, talk to me about the not sorry method. How does the not sorry method work? Okay, so it's two steps, and it's based in what I call mental decluttering, which is just like physical decluttering. You got to discard, and then you got to organize. So the same way that you get rid of stuff in your closet that, as Marie Kondo, the original tidier, would yes. say, does not bring you joy, <laughs> I say you got to get stuff out of your head that annoys you. And once you have managed to discard all of that stuff, which is the first step of the not sorry method, deciding what you no longer give an F about what you don't care about. Step two is not giving enough about those things. Stop spending your time, energy, and money on them so you can organize your life around everything that you have left. And the reason it's called the not sorry method is a nod again to Marie Kondo and her KonMari method for decluttering your house. I'm sure your listeners have have read her book and seen her Netflix show. But my whole method is about doing all of this with honesty and politeness so that, again, you have controlled your own behavior. You have nothing to to apologize for and nothing to feel guilty about for having set those boundaries and discarded the Fs you no longer give and organized your life around them, you are not sorry. (laughs) I love it. I love it. And I feel like too, it just, you know, in this past year, I feel like so many of us are spending so much time in our homes and you you start to look around and you're like, why do I have that box over there? When am I going to get rid of that pillow or whatever? And it's like, why do we not do that inside our heads? <laughs> like, when do we take inventory of all the things that we're holding on to? I, I love that so very much. Well, yeah. And I mean, a lot of us are spending a lot of time in our own heads this year too. Yes. So it's yes. uh, especially important to mentally declutter. Unfortunately, it's not as beautiful on Instagram as those perfectly lined up containers with all the snack foods, but it is probably way better for your mental health to do the mental exercise. <laughs> I highly recommend it. (laughs) So why do you think women struggle to say no to the things that they really don't want to do? I think about this all the time. Recently, someone asked me like, hey, can you do a quick zoom in? And when I was on the spot, I was like, yeah. And then I thought about it when I got home and I was like, ah, you know, I actually don't really want to do that. And thankfully, they were super gracious. But why is it our tendency to say yes when there are things that we don't necessarily feel called to do, compelled to do, or want to do? Well, to be clear, I am not a scientist, but I can tell you that the science says that women, you know, from beginning, from being young girls, are socialized to serve, to make other people feel good, to both avoid and and mitigate conflict. And men, boys, are socialized to win. So there is a lot that goes on in our psyches from day one that puts women in this position to tend to everybody else's needs before they tend to their own. And the analogy that I give in my books is, you know, you have to actually put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. Because if you don't tend to your own needs first, you will not be enough of a partner, a spouse, a parent, an employee, an employer for those other people in your life because you will be so burnt out. But that is unfortunately not the way we learn it as girls. We learn to 
make everybody else feel good, make sure everybody has what they need, serve everyone else before we serve ourselves. And boys are socialized to win. So they have this very narrow focus at achieving their goals. And women need to help everybody else achieve their goals first before we get to our own. So that is, you know, that's just something that we've been dealing with culturally, uh, you know, since the beginning of time. And my hope is that when people read my books, women and men, they understand that there's a difference between being selfish and what I call selfish. And this idea that, you know, you need to look out for yourself as long as it's not hurting anybody else. Yeah. Look out for number one, and then you can focus and be the best version of you for all those other people in your life. And again, it's really important to think of the decisions that you make as, you know, helping yourself more than they're hurting others. I'm not out there advocating for people to just become single minded in their pursuit of their own goals such that they hurt other people in their life, whether it's emotionally or financially or whatever. But, you know, I think that women need to work on winning too. And sometimes that just means winning your own life, you know, and being happy. Like that is a goal in and of itself. As a mom of a daughter, when I like hear about like all the cultural conditioning and stuff, it's like my tendency is like push back, push back. It's so interesting because raising a little girl, it's like, you know, you just want her to have the best opportunity and the change that we all desire so desperately. And it's like, I'm always just thinking of like all of these conditioning things and it's like, how can we push against that? So I think what is so amazing about our generation is that we're so much more aware of these things. And I do think that a lot of parents these days are so thoughtful about what we're talking about and with this deep, deep desire of like, we need to help raise up this next generation to not have to stumble through what we've stumbled through. So it's such a mind game though, let me tell you. (laughs) I bet. I mean, I'm really admiring of all of the moms and, and parents out there. I don't have kids of my own. Uh, that's a choice that my husband and I made and, and we're very happy about it. But I know that there are you know, just so many obstacles out there when it comes to parenting. And I just, yeah. I hope that what you're able to do with your show for your listeners and what I'll, you know, hopefully starting to do with my own show and stuff is, is to show people that, you know, there just are other ways. There are different yes. ways. It doesn't always have to be done the same way that it was done before and that you can affect change, you know, on the micro level for the next generation, just by being aware of it, like you said, just yeah. by having a little bit more of an educated perspective and, uh, and, you know, trying different things to get the result that you hope for, for your kids. Oh, I love that. So let's shift gears a tiny bit. And I just want to say, I recognize that, you know, in this era right now, even having a job that you want to quit is a huge, immense privilege these days. But there's also this population of people who listen to this show, who deeply desire to quit their jobs, to do something that matters more to them. And so I want to know, do you think being unhappy in a job is enough of a reason to quit? I feel like I get DMs asking me this every day. So I want to hear your answer. Well, with the caveat, as you said, that, you know, having a job right now is a privilege for a lot of people and that times are hard. If we're speaking generally, I do. I do think that being unhappy is a reason to leave your job because you spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day doing that job. You spend four, five, six days a week doing that job. And it is really essential for your mental health and well-being, not just for your bank account, that you are able to, you know, get up and go there and do that work and not, you know, and not hate every second of it. Are you going to hate some seconds of it? Yes. Are you going to hate some days of it? Of course. But I learned when I focused on what was causing the incredible surge of panic and anxiety and depression that I was feeling back in 2014. It took me a year to quit my job after I started feeling that, by the way. I I actually spent a year saving up. That's a whole other story about daily planning and and organizing. But, uh, (laughs) But just mentally speaking, I had to acknowledge that it was so important that I not be so unhappy. And since that time, I have seen friends and family go through the same thing that I was going through and realize that it was okay to want to be happier and that it was okay to, I, I don't know who originally said this, but you know, to, 
just because you spent so much time making a mistake doesn't mean you should keep making it. You know, it was okay to leave a job, a boss, a situation, a partnership that wasn't making them happy. And in fact, just recently, a really good friend of mine quit a job you know, that she had once been very excited about that was making her deeply unhappy for the last two years. And she found herself a new gig. And all of this happened right smack in the middle of of the pandemic. And it was just so important for her to not be so desperately unhappy in her working life that she made it happen. And again, you know, she had a lot of opportunities that people, other people don't necessarily have right now. But I was so, so glad for her when she called me up and said, I'm going to give my notice tomorrow and I have a new gig lined up. Ugh. I think so much of what you speak about, Sarah, when you talk about you know time, energy, and money, I feel like oftentimes people get so fixated on the money that they just kind of are willing to trade their time and energy to get it. And I've been studying a lot about like what is that threshold of happiness? Because I think it's really important that in today's kind of hustle culture mentality that preaches like more, 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 you know, I found that I've been just as happy with less. And I think that understanding that just as you were talking about earlier, you know, time is this like non-renewable resource, like energy. Sure. You can wake up and get more, but I think it's so interesting these days, how willingly people trade their time and energy in, in the pursuit of more money. And it's funny because, I mean, have you ever met people where they're working so hard to earn more, but they never even pause to enjoy it? Like, it's like you're working all the time. Like, sure, you have a yacht or a private jet or whatever people are going after. And it's like you don't even enjoy those things because you've built this life that requires you to keep going to keep up with it. What are your thoughts on that? Because I've just been thinking about it so much these days. And I think that I'm an old soul who I'm like, time is our most valuable currency. What are your thoughts? Yeah, money is so complicated. My own relationship with it is so complicated. I grew up middle class. I, I might even say lower middle class, although I don't know exactly what the threshold was, you know, 30, 40 years ago. But it was, you know, money was always an issue. It was concerning to me. I saw the effects of not being able to afford certain things. I saw people in much you know, worse positions than I was in. And I also saw people who had so much and I, I wanted it, you know, and I, I moved to the most expensive city in the world. I was deep, deep, deep in student loan debt. I worked in book publishing, which is a notoriously low paying industry. And I had a perfectly fine life, but I was living paycheck to paycheck for years and years and years. And now I'm doing really, really well. And yeah. I think every day about remembering how much value I placed on earning money and having spending power and making sure that I don't go you know, too far into the other direction where now that I have the spending power and the earnings that I always wanted, I don't want to get into a position where I want more. Yeah. I don't need more and yep. I don't want to work myself into a hole again, you know, a mental health hole in order to have more. So when I talk about those resources, time, energy, and money, I am talking not only about spending your money on things, you know, being like, you know what? I don't give an F about contributing to a group gift for my office nemesis, and I am not going to spend that $10. I'm also talking about valuing your own worth and what you make and saying, mm -hmm. I'm not willing to put up with an abusive client to get their money. I don't need that money at the expense of my health and happiness. So it works both ways. And I am, because my relationship with money has always been so complicated, I am always thinking about it and always trying to make sure that I am balancing what I want, what I truly need, what I want, and what I don't actually need in order to have that mental health that is so precious that money can't buy. Uh, it can certainly help, you know, particularly if you can pay for therapy. But it really, my mental health really cannot be, and I won't let it be dependent on my financial health. I've got to keep those things separate because I know what happens when I get over-concerned with one or the other. So that's a kind of a rambling answer, but you hit on a really hot button topic for me. So, yes. you know, I think it's complicated for all of us and it's natural to feel, 
you know, really, really conflicted and divided at any given time. And so thinking about it as, you know, a resource and what that resource yeah. is worth to you, I think is a, is a good way to narrow your focus when it comes to your financial health. Yes, that's wonderful. I agree so much. So let's talk about one more new identity, Sarah, and that is your new podcast. So first off, what has it felt like launching a new extension of what you've already created? How has that felt? It's really satisfying, I have to say. Yes. Uh, turns out I love to hear myself talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it's been a big learning curve. You know, I got real good at writing books and I did not know what I was doing launching a podcast. I had a lot of other folks uh, who helped me out along the way, successful shows like yours to listen to and learn from. And I've got about a month's worth of episodes under my belt now of the No Fs Given podcast. It is really satisfying, especially because I'm starting to hear from listeners. I'm starting to get that yeah. listener feedback and it seems like it's going over really, really well. Amazing. What part were you most resistant about about the platform? Because I feel like no matter what platform you're starting on, there's always those hesitancies or those things where you're like, but really, what what was it for you about podcasting? For me, it was my lifelong tendency toward perfectionism. And yes. as my husband will tell you, I don't do anything <laughs> that I don't think I'm good at and I don't play any games that I don't think I can win. And so I was really intimidated by a whole yeah. new format. You know, I, I was like, I don't want to be bad at it. I don't yeah. want people to, to see my learning curve in action or hear my learning curve in action. And so I'm really lucky and grateful that I have this production team, Cadence 13, behind me. And they have been so willing to answer 17 emails a day from me about what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing and what's the best practices and all of that. But that was really the initial. The initial fear was, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't want to yeah. be bad at it. And I don't want to yeah. disappoint people. And then as it turned out, it does kind of come naturally. Nice. <laughs> Just the talking into the microphone part, not all of the other not all of the other stuff, the marketing and the scheduling and all of that. But talking, I can do. So it worked <sighs> out. I'm so excited for you. And I just get so excited when I see women popping up with new shows because I just think, you know, podcasts are such an incredible way to learn and be entertained and find joy and feel like you're in community, even if you just have your earbuds in and you're out on a walk or you're washing the dishes. And so I'm just so, so excited for you. So I need to know, so how would you describe what you're doing with your new podcast that's expanding on what you already write about and what you already teach? So the way I look at it every week, every episode is kind of a mini masterclass in right. some topic that I have already written or spoken about, but that I'm distilling for an audience of people. I just imagine that these are people who have never heard of me, have never read one of my books, have no idea what I'm all about, and how am I going to convey tips and strategies for living your best life? through my sweary lens to somebody <laughs> who's starting from a base of zero knowledge about what I do. Yeah. And that has also really helped me focus because another thing I was worried about, I'm kind of long-winded. I take a while to work up to the meat of my argument. You know, my book editor is always like, take this thing that you wrote in the last page <laughs> and move it to the first page. Oh. This is your idea. So I was worried about not being able to really kind of concisely encapsulate that stuff. And, you know, with a little bit of advanced planning, it turns out that I can get it down into, you know, 30, 40 minutes and really give people kind of a topical episode with actionable tips. I want people to be able to pop out those earbuds or get out of their car when they've reached their destination and say, I have one, two, three things that I've learned that are easy, that are easy to remember and easy to implement. And I can yes. do them this week until I listen to next week's show. Yes. Ugh. I feel like podcasting introduces some interesting challenges. And one of them is listening to your own voice, right? I like <laughs> cannot go back to my own episode ones because I'm like, who is that Valley girl? Like what is happening here? But also I think that it just, it does kind of challenge us to like get to the point in a really succinct way that also communicates and drives people into action. And, and I love that how you focus on this is is so tactical and it's like implementable. I don't think that's a word, but we'll make it one. Sounds You're like the a book word. editor here. <laughs> 
And so I think, I think it's just brilliant how you are taking all of these ideas. And the thing that I, I think that I want people to know as well is a lot of times we always think, well, I already talked about that, or I already wrote about that. I already did that. But sometimes we need to hear things over and over and over again to get them through our thick skulls, right? Or sometimes we need to hear it in a different way. So I'm just, I'm so excited about your show, the way you're doing it, the format, the idea behind it. So congratulations on launching. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Again, there are so many women like you who have come before and conquered this medium and have built these audiences and communities. And I'm really, I stand in awe. Um, I've only been at this for, like I said, about a month. So I'm hoping that at this time next year, I'll be able to be one of the old guard and welcoming somebody new into the fold. But thank you really for the encouragement. Yes. So where can everybody find you, connect with you, read your books, listen to your new show? Give us all of the places. Okay. I'm going to say a bad word. So cover your children's (laughs) ears if they're in the room. My website is nofucksgivenguides.com. That's plural. It's where you can find all of the information about me, my books, my journals, the podcast, all of the downloads of all of the methods and the flow charts. My flow charts are very popular and the quizzes, all of the news items. And also on the podcast page, I put up every podcast I've ever recorded on as a guest. So awesome. this one will be up there when it comes out. So you can go to nofucksgivenguides.com and find everything. You can follow me on social media, across social media at mcsnugs, M-C-S-N-U-G-Z. I won't get into the, the story behind that. But I've been on Twitter for a long time and that was my name there. So it's my name everywhere. But I also maintain accounts specifically for the books at No Fucks Given Guides on Instagram and No Fucks Given on Twitter. And I just joined TikTok at No Woo! Fucks Given Guides. So um, me and my giant forehead and my under eye bags are over on TikTok now. So that ought to do it. But go to the website and it'll send you everywhere else. Amazing. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for sharing. And again, congratulations on launching your own podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, that conversation was so much fun. I honestly pinch myself that I get to interview incredible people like Sarah and call it my job. And I also just love getting to welcome new women into this space. Podcasting has absolutely transformed my life. And I just believe that so many of us, we need many different mentors and leaders and voices into our lives so that we can become the people that we want to be, whatever version we want to show up as. So I am so thrilled for Sarah and her new podcast. And I'm so just blessed that this show gives me the opportunity to connect with amazing and life-changing women like her. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Until next time, keep digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 